Good afternoon. And it's certainly a great honor to be invited here to speak in the celebration of Professor Kessler's life. I feel that when Dan gave a talk this morning, and he said, when Kalapnos came to Paris, half of the audience here were not born yet. I, I'm probably on the borderline of not being born and being born. So indeed, I've never had a chance uh, had uh, meeting with Professor Kessler in person. But I felt great comfort to know that Bill Phillips even uh, had not met with Kessler either. <laughs> So, so I felt OK. But on the other hand, this probably is where the legacy is. For people who have never met with Professor Kessler, and we are here gathering together to celebrate his life because his scientific impact is so huge. And I will tell you a story of optical atomic clocks. But before I do that, I want to tell you about the first paper I read um, about Professor Kessler. And in fact, that was the only paper I read about Professor, from Professor Kessler until the beginning of this year, and I'll come back to that point later. This was a paper I read when I was a graduate student with Dr. John Hall. And at the time, we were doing spectroscopy. And, and I came across this paper in publishing applied optics. And when I say I read the first Kessler paper, I was actually kind of half lying, because the paper was published in French. <laughs> I, I didn't understand at the time why applied optics in an American journal <laughs> had, a, had a French paper published there. Uh, it, you know, apparently, that was the, 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 at the time was the case. Whoever the scientist came from, which German background, French background, you can publish papers in your native language, except the, the, the summary. The, the abstract, I can read in English. And there are a few words which actually, to this day, impact my scientific life. He said two things. One, it's really interesting to investigate the general properties of fabric pearl cavities when the atoms are placed inside. And I think since then, I've been always loving cavities. And throughout my physics work, I always use cavities. Uh, and I think that played a big role. The second sentence, which is almost trivial looking back, he said, if you put an atom inside a cavity, it's equivalent to a long absorption path in an ordinary light beam. Very simple sentence. And I was able to, I was intrigued by this, actually went into the paper looked it through English-French dictionary, found a few English French words that I needed to know, but the formulas, the mathematical language, I can understand. And that's a paper, I think, to me, was a very celebrated paper. For me, this was the first time introducing the concept of you, you can measure something extremely well by having a mirror looking at the atom over and over. And I would say this precedes the cavity QED and so on. At the time, people were thinking about Purcell was thinking about boundary conditions. And finally, Serge Haloche, uh, Dan Klapner, and so on, and uh, uh, Jeff Kimball were able to combine boundary conditions and high finesse cavity together and really form the new field of the cavity QED. So I think if uh, Professor Kessler is here today, he would be, I think, very pleased to see that we are not using ordinary light anymore. We're using frequency combs which was invented by Jan Hall and Ted Hensch for frequency metrology work. But we can put a frequency comb through a cavity, just like he said. And now the entire frequency comb goes through the cavities, and you can have a bunch of molecules going by, and we can measure all of this absorption uh, through the rotational vibrational bands. In fact, we can identify people's breath. We can measure chemical reaction process in the most recent paper we published show that we can even probe real-time chemical reactions in, in air. And that really, t the, the scientific vibration from Kessler's paper, we can still feel today, and it's still going on strong. But I would rather go back to this optical atomic clock, this op that we are celebrating optical physics that Professor Kessler had such a profound impact on. My particular field of building atomic clock and I think the inspiration really comes from we can use a clock to probe fundamental and emerging physics. And I, I mentioned that I only read this Kessler, only one of the Kessler's papers before the, this year. And the reason I went back to read the Kessler's papers was because of this symposium. I felt since I'm invited, I better do a scholarly work and go back, you know, sort of almost like a, learn the history a little bit. And that made it was, I really felt this was a really worthwhile uh, 
journey to go back and read about those papers. Because as a graduate student, when I was growing up in the mid 90s uh, as a graduate student, I read a lot of scientific literature, I still do. But usually, you say, there's a question I don't understand, and you go, go back to the scientific literature, read again, and you go back again until you understood it. And usually, you ended up finding a paper written by Jean Dalibar in the, in the Club Continuity, and that's the end of the story. You read their paper, it's all clear, and you don't need to go further. Or sometimes you consult with the books that's written by Alan S. Bay or uh, written by Search, um, uh, 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 Hiroshi and Ramon paper, uh, books on cavity QED. But you really have to go back further. Uh, and this was an incredible opportunity because of the celebrating Kessler. I actually went back to read Kessler's papers for the first time. And it was just incredible revelation of how, where, where Claude came from, where all these you know, incredible scientific thoughts, how that came along the history. And I, I want to put that peppered into my talk and show you some of the connections, even though I've never met with that gentleman, but his work really is resonating throughout the modern epic of building atomic clocks. You know, in building atomic clock is an interesting endeavor. It, it really involves all corners of AML physics, whether it's a precise measurement, ultra-fast science, ultra-cold matter, theory contributions it, coming together that allow you to build the very best atomic clocks today. And I think it also this is a place where AML physics actually meets the central challenge in many different areas of physics, whether it's many body quantum correlations. We heard about quantum simulations. We can use in clocks to actually do quantum simulations. But more importantly, perhaps, that a clock will allow us to test fundamental physics questions, symmetry. Uh, gravitational physics, probe unknown territories like dark energy, dark matter, and so on, and providing new tools for chemistry and for biology. We just heard of this fantastic talk. The physics tools can become such a useful tool for, for medicine. And this is indeed where the exciting aspect of doing AML physics has this sense of precision measurements, but have very large impact to other areas of science and society. So I want to go back to uh, make some sort of historical remark of how the frequency standards for strontium started in Jela. And actually, this was a paper I also had a, a, a huge impact on me. This was written by my thesis advisor, Zhang Hall, back in 1989. Um, this was the fountain clock started to came back. Uh, Steve Chu was doing the fountain clock. And uh, CERT here uh, it was uh, build, building the atomic fountain clock at that time. This paper was about building an optical frequency standards in a fountain. Jan has many incredible physical insights. But this is one of them that he, he later on told me, well, it's probably not a, such a good idea. And the reason be is because for optical frequency standards, you're using, opt you're using lasers to probe atomic transitions in the optical frequency range. Velocity of the atoms becomes a big deal. You know, it's just like if you have certain beam size and atoms are moving too fast through it, you are going to pick up a lot of systematic errors. So the question really came to, my, to our mind was, we have this fantastic atom, a strontium, that has a two valence electrons, so you have a spin singlets and spin triplets. At the time, Jan and Alan Gallagher and Chris Green were thinking about the transition of a triple P2. They already knew that they can do two-stage cooling on, on the strong transition and the weak transition on triple P1. And the clock state, they were thinking about the triple P2. And this, this state is supposed to be very long-lived. Uh, and at the time when you talk about quality factor of greater than 10 to the 15, this seems like a, a dream far in the future. But nevertheless, it's something that's interesting to pursue. And, but we, as I said, we probably need to keep the atom stationary. And, and that means, and if it's a neutral, we, we probably have to think about optical traps. And this is the first thing that, uh, now you can go back to read the Nobel lecture of uh, Professor Kessler. Uh, and I read this word by word. Uh, and it, he, in one of the sentences he said, clock continuity show the action of light on the atom produce a shift of the ground level of the atom. 
And that's, this is where the origin of the optical trappings come from, because as soon as you know there's producing an energy shift, then all you need is to produce a spatially inhomogeneous energy shift, and that's a trap. So, so this is the first clue where you're going to build atomic clock in the future in the optical domain. You want to trap them. And then I went on to become a postdoc with Jeff Kimball at Caltech. In 1999, Jeff was fussing around with keeping a single atom trapped in the cavity in the optical domain. And uh, I was a postdoc, and we were building optical traps inside the cavity, trying to hold atoms there. And as soon as we started doing cavity QED physics, we, we faced this very frustrating problem because the trap, the, the ordinary trap looks like this. Uh, and this is actually, if you want to read about it, you go back to 1985, there's a paper in Joseph B published by um, Delibar and Continuity tells you about the dipole force fluctuation, where in ordinary dipole trap, the two states are opposing each other when you apply, electrical, uh, apply optical field, and therefore, when, when, whenever there's a possibility for atom to be excited from ground to excited state, it will feel the potential of rolling down the hill and then gets de-excited, and this process just heats up the atom tremendously. And this is all very well described mathematically in that 1985 paper. So we struggled and we, we came up with this idea of maybe we should do state insensitive dipole trap where the potential of a ground state and excited state are matched. If that were the case, the atom could go being excited in cavity QED sort of a setting, but there won't be any dipole force fluctuations. It will keep the atom to being cold in there. And this, I, when I went back to Jela to be a faculty member in 99, I carried that idea with me to seek the help of Chris Green. And in, Chris who had a, all the energy states of a strong team in his hand, and so he could have calculated this very quickly. And this was actually the email from 2000. He said, Jun, I can tell you what magic wavelengths you need to use. And this is a, that, that email he showed. Um, and he was calculating, of course, it was a triple P2, because at the time that was, was Jan's idea and Alan Gallagher's idea of looking at that as a clock state. So Chris was able to find the single sort of triple P2, but then he tells me, well, there will be some vector and scalar and the tensor shifts because there's angular momentum. And it was just about that time, Professor Katori from the University of Tokyo came up with the idea of, well, you actually do triple P0. And it turns out that's not a, such a new idea. It, in fact, in aluminum ion clock, Hans Demelt in 1992 had a proposed you use triple P0. Here I find another connection to, to Professor Kessler, who told us that angular momentum has consequences, not just in optical pumping. If you think about atom-light interactions, you have both real imaginary parts. Angular momentum is going to impact on both the real parts and the imaginary parts in both scattering and energy level shifts. And so this J equal to zero obviously is a much better idea than a J equals to two, because electronically now you do not have to worry about vector and tensor shifts. Although I'm going to come back to that point later with nuclear spin. But as, at least electronically, we do not have to worry about that. And here's the energy level structure. If you think about strontium atom, or for that matter, any two electron atoms, you have the so-called spin singlet families and spin triplet families. And that's where the freedom comes in that if you come with a laser that's trying to trap it, as a clock calculated, when you have applied the laser, it's going to create energy shift. And so this laser light, the red laser, for the, if the atom is in the ground state, mostly interacting with the singlet family, so you can use a singlet P1 to, to shift the energy level of singlet S0. On the other hand, the same laser is also acting on the triplet family. So if the atom had the population in the triplet P0, its frequency shift, the energy level shift, will be associated with the coupling to the oscillators in the triplet family. And because you have these two different families, it's, it will allow you the freedom of picking a particular wavelength where the, the frequency shift of single S0 and triple P0 can be matched. And this is what this calculation is. It, it shows the, the red color is actually the polarizability of the triple P0 state single S0 is a polarization, a polarizability of the, single, of the ground state, and they can match at a particular wavelength around 800 nanometers. And if you use that to probe the clock, 
now you have the advantage of being able to have very long coherence time, uh, and it, as well as being able to hold the atom in the trap with the hope that the trap does not introduce systematic errors in your clock measurement because AC stock shift is matched. And, and then more, more than that is finally that frees us for, from just doing single trapped ion work because atom-atom interactions are weaker, so we can put many, many of those atoms in there and essentially create many parallel pendulums to improve on the clock precision. So the next natural question is, what is the lifetime of Tropa P0? Um, if you think about the strontium-87 uh, isotope has a nuclear spin of 9 half. In the ground state, J equal to 0. Electronic angular momentum equals to 0. In the triple P0 state, electronic excited state, the angular momentum also is 0. So I thought J, even though there's I, but J is 0, so there's no hyperfine. And these will be just nuclear, spin, uh, nuclear moments. That turns out, because of the presence of a nuclear spin, there is actually hyperfine mixing between triple P0 and triple P1 and a single P1 electronic states. So the triple P0 wave function is not as pure as a single S0, has all these mixing terms. They're small, but nevertheless, they are there. How do we measure that? And that, again, goes back to Professor Kessler's teaching. You can measure differential Landau G factor. Because of this perturbation of triple P0 due to other states, if you apply a magnetic field, the Zeeman shift of a single S0 and a triple P0 turns out to be different. And if you can measure this difference, that actually tells you about these mixing coefficients of the wave functions. And as soon as you know that, you know the wave function, you know the lifetime of the triple P0. And this is exactly how we found out how long the triple P0 state live. So this is what Kessler said in his Nobel lec uh, lecture. From the position of those resonance lines, we can make a very precise measurements of land of factors, and then to deduce from them very precise value of nuclear magnetic moments. And we are deducing nuclear magnetic moments and also differential land of G factors between those two clock states. Um, in the, the consequence of that is there's a Z-man shift, there's a vector tensor light shifts, and this is a really important key point to the vote the most recent experiment, we are now putting quantum gas of strontium in a three-dimensional optical lattice. And I'm going to come back to the end of my talk to tell you the importance of controlling the vector tensor shifts in a three-dimensional optical lattice in the, in the context of optical atomic clock. And, but we can measure this with optically with high resolution. That's exactly what Kessler did. And so how, how we did this nuclear magnetic resonance, I call it NMR, even though it's not really traditional NMR in the optical domain, is simply using a very small magnetic field to split those Z-man levels and relying on the fact that we have very narrow line with laser. Those atoms have very long coherence time. You can just simply, with just a half a gauss of Earth field, you can split all of, them, all of these magnetic sublevels and just, just measure the distance between those that tell you the delta G, the differential length of G factors. And once you know that, you can, you can, from this delta G measurement, you can calculate what triple P0 lifetime, it's 140 seconds. And it turns out our most recent measurement by putting atoms in the lattice and watching them decay in the triple P0, it, it pretty much confirms 160 seconds, not, not the number um, from each other. So what does 160 second lifetime mean for triple P0? I think it means quite a bit for, for a clockmaker because if you think of, you put it in a coherent superposition between single S0 and triple P0, that this cloud will oscillate. And if I slow down the oscillation by a factor of 10 to the 15, you have a pendulum that's oscillating once per second. And this quality factor is so good, 10 to the 17, meaning that if you have a pendulum like this oscillating once per second, if you set it at the beginning, the God sets it at the beginning of the universe, it's still oscillating today. Uh, and so if you want to build a clock, you want to build a clock with a pendulum that never stops. Uh, so of course, I was exaggerating the oscillating the entire age of the universe. I was trying to emphasize the fact that this quality factor is really amazingly good, 10 to the 17. So, so we are all set to do some of the precision spectroscopy now uh, for clocks with atoms confined in a in this particular case, one-dimensional optical lattice, just simple optical beam gets retro reflected. You get about 1,000 atoms loaded in here. 
we typically have about 100 pancakes in the jello experiment at least, and about 10 atoms per pancake or so. The precision improvement is by square root of atom number unless you start to do spin squeezing. But this is already a remarkable improvement. Uh, and later on, I'm going to show, tell you at least our vision, you know, being able to go to this, with this atom number going to a million. And in experiments like this, the confinement of the optical lattice is so strong, there's no more photon recoil effect. You are in the so-called lamb dickey regime that Luis talked about earlier today in the morning. There's no Doppler shifts. And so the only thing that's really needed to be worried about the interaction effects where, you, you, as you know, we probably can't have free lunch. On one hand, you enjoy a large number of atoms to increase the signal to noise ratio, but most likely you're going to suffer a little bit on clock accuracy. Uh, and this has been the uh, sort of the, the question that we wanted to answer from the very beginning for building this many particle clock. What I really take home being very proud of is this kind of a very precise line shape that you can study that looks just like a textbook examples of Arabi or Ramsey line shapes in a very high resolution. Uh, th this, uh, the, in, back in 2006 or so, we were able to uh, recover a five hertz transition line with. And that was sufficient for us to build an atomic clock to push the accuracy to uh, at the level of one times 10 to minus 16 at the time in 2008. And there was a, a number of measurements down in Boulder, Colorado, in Seattle, Paris, University of Tokyo, and so on. And their numbers actually agree by connected by through the cesium clock and agreed at the level of the international comparison of the cesium clock level. And this was, that's why strontium was recommended as practical realization of the meter and the secondary representation of SI in second. And in, indeed, there has been a lot of activities Locally, in particular, this was the term optical second was actually coined for the first time in this particular paper from Sir to Paris, saying that maybe it's time to think about redefining the second because optical frequency standards is now exceeding a microwave clock. And I'm, in fact, I'm going to tell you some of the recent results um, not only exceeding at the, ten, at the same level of magnitude, but we, we are now two orders of magnitude ahead. And I think in the next 10 years, it's going to be five orders ahead. So optical coherence time, to, we, in, in, from 2008 to now, another effort that we have been spending a lot of time on, uh, on is improving lasers, because optical coherence time is obviously very important. As I advertised, the triple P0 has optical coherence time of 160 seconds. It's, it's really interesting to talk about optical coherence at the time scales where we talk about nuclear spin coherence uh, of many seconds. And so we are, we're building lasers like this with a fabric pearl cavity. Um, the, say the cavity has a length of a meter and you want to reach a stability of one part in 10 to 16, meaning that you have to control the cavity fluctuation, length fluctuation at the level of 10 to minus 16 meters, a, a fraction of the size of a nucleus. And in fact, we can now reach 10, almost 10 to minus 17 level of length fluctuations. The cavity is made out of me mechanical systems. Mechanical systems has, has loss, has dissipation. Associated with dissipation, there's a fluctuation. And this is so-called a thermal fluctuation. It's actually fundamental noise, whether it's for us or whether it's for people in LIGO detect detecting gravitational waves. It's always this mechanical system sitting in the finite temperature has this fin fundamental uh, thermal noise contributions. That is what's limiting us now at the moment for optical cavity coherence that we can achieve whether it's a, the, our system for, uh, for strontium with a 40 centimeter your E cavity, or the recent new concept of building cavities out of a silicon crystal and so on, we were able to reach the thermal noise limit, achieving laser line with the, on the order of 10 millihertz or so, uh, with a coherence time on the order of uh, 10 seconds. Essentially, stability less than 10 to minus 16, line with 10 to 30 millihertz, coherence time 20 seconds, not quite enough to be matched with a strontium but it's getting us forward uh, as we continue to improve on these lasers. With those laser improvements, the clock performance did improve over the last 10 years or so, from 2006 when we recovered the two hertz line to about 2012 or so, we recovered about a factor of five improvement, resulting in directly in clock improvement by a factor of 10. 
And, and today, we were able to now demonstrate 80 millihertz line with for the strontium atomic clock. And with this kind of a line with, you can build, say, two independent clocks and compare them. That shows the stability at a few parts 10 to minus 16 going averaging down as a, as a time. Uh, this shows the instability of the clock. This shows the averaging time. Passing 10 to minus 17 uh, level at, at about a cup of coffee time and going down to 10 to minus 18. The similar performance is being shown in the utopium clock as well in our enabling labs by Andrew Ladalaw. And, uh, and this kind of a stability does represent a factor of 10 improvement of a single trap, the ion clock, just because we have so many more particles and about a factor of 100 stability improvement over cesium clocks. And the, at the moment, because of that kind of stability, which is still improving, we can evaluate systematic uncertainties in the clocks much faster. Uh, and in fact, uh, up about two years ago, we were able to evaluate jelly clock to two parts in 10 to minus 18 um, clock uncertainty. And I, I, I'm very excited for the future uh, improvements that, that I'm going to tell you in the, in the second half of my talk. Not, not second half, one second, one third of my talk. Uh, and the one particular systematic effect, remember I told you about it, was interactions. The, this is something that's a compromise between having lots of atoms here that's going to improve on the signal to noise ratio versus collisional effects, which is going to limit the systematic problem. So, this is where underlying the motivation of picking fermionic atoms, because when the temperature is extremely low, the poly exclusion principle tells you the anti-symmetrization of the wave function has to have this negative sign, meaning the two atoms cannot have symmetrical S-wave interactions. So, was, so back in 2007, we indeed, at the 10 to minus 15 level of precision, we see no shift, and that was great. But as Kessler said, and this was also in his lecture, Several times, the experimental results were contrary to our predi predictions, thus creating problems whose solution led to advances that were as interesting as they were unexpected. And I hope I, I can tell you now a story of exactly in that spirit. So when we improved the precision by a factor of 10 in 10 to minus 16, we actually saw the shift. And this is due to the fact that two atoms just circling around each other in the P wave interactions. And I want to point out this tremendous contribution of my colleague, Anna Maria Ray, giving us the theory guide on, on, on this journey of figuring things out. And once we understood where this collisional problem came from, we can actually now find out ways by creating different geometry or, or f operating in a particular uh, way of a frequency shift by operating at a particular block angle. We can actually cancel these uh, clock collisional shift at the level of less than 10 to minus 18. And in fact, in the most recent work of three-dimensional optical lattice clocks, this contact interaction effect is now being reduced to 10 to minus 24. And so it's really out. The, the remaining problem is, in fact, is another Kessler's contribution, which is the atoms are so densely packed, there will be dipole-dipole interaction in a many-body effect. And, and that will be a, for a future topic that we can discuss. But I want to come back to this sort of optical pumping and, and, and uh, angular momentum issue. In strontium, we have three degrees of freedom, electronic, spin up and down, Nuclear, you know, you have 10 nuclear spin states being nine and a half. And then spatial dimensional wave functions as well. So those atoms are confined in, in quantized manner in optical traps. So we all know that in the end, you have to put all these degrees of freedom together. Because it's a fermion, uh, in the end, the product of them has to have a negative anti-symmetrization. So this anti-symmetrization could have come from Nuclear being a triplet, singlet. Electronic could be a triplet or singlet. And emotional can be triplet or singlet. And so if, imagine you pick nuclear spin polarized state, nuclear triplets. And if electronically it's also triplet, say both atoms are pointing down, or both are pointing up, or one up, down, plus down, up, then you, the, the interaction between these atoms have to be so-called a P wave, has to be anti-symmetrized. And vice versa, if you just make a little bit of a control on the nuclear spins, make it anti-symmetrized, suddenly this, the symmetrized electronic spins, clock states, can have now S-wave interactions. So the nuclear spin is, remember this I dot J term is zero. So the nuclear spin supposedly plays no role in the electronic interactions. But there's a fundamental quantum statistics 
it plays. And you can control now by controlling the, the, the coherent superposition of nuclear spins to how the two atoms come together and electronically interact with each other. And this is a very simple physics. We can all open Claude's quantum physics book and it's all there uh, for graduate students. So the first case, say nuclear spins are polarized. You can, 10 particles in a single pancake. And when you do clock measurement, it's nothing but using lasers or microwave to drive the spin. And you look at the block sphere, how that spin rotates up. There's a noise fundamentally associated with the, with the quantum projection of the measurement. But if there's interactions between these particles, these interactions are weak because we picked the fermions. Nevertheless, it has energy scale on the order of about a hertz or so. We measured it. But our laser has a coherence time of 10 seconds, or at least in the future, we are hoping to go to 160 seconds. One hertz time 10 second is much, much greater than one. And that means these noise, those, those spins, in fact, become correlated. And you can actually measure directly on the block sphere the spin noise distribution and show this kind of non-classical spin, spin noise uh, correlations uh, in, in, in directed in the clock measurements. We can also explore the so-called SUN symmetry, relying on the fact that those nuclear spins, in fact, has no I dot J term. So if I use the plus 9 half state as my clock states, but now I open my game up by sprinkle with many, many particles with different nuclear spins. And what happens is SUN symmetry is that those particles will act as, distribute, as, as a spectator atoms. And no matter where nuclear spin states you put it on there, their impact on the clock state, on these clock atoms, will be the same. That's what SUN symmetry tells us. And of course, Professor Kessler says, it's all possible by optical pumping to create an atomic orientation. And also due to the coupling between electronic and magnetic moment and nuclear spins, a nuclear orientation. And we are doing exactly that. We can use this optical pumping through triple P1 state and create whatever the nuclear spin uh, distributions that we wanted in his language, orientation of the nuclear spins in the lab space. And indeed, when you go on to make measurement of frequency shift, you can see all of these different nuclear spin distributions fall on the same line as you measure the clock shifts in a very precise manner. So this is what the SUN symmetry means. And it actually opens up a really interesting quantum simulation experiment in the future. This is where, for example, if we allow the atoms to be start to be able to tunnel between one pancake to another, if the exp if physics is all the phys if physics is done in within one pancake, then it really doesn't matter if your laser field had a different wavelength than the wavelength of the, of the lattice laser. Because each, each atom, uh, so, sorry, within each pancake, the atom, 10 atoms will experience the same laser phase. And you are doing physics within this pancake, within that pancake, they are all isolated. But as soon as the atom can tunnel, this atom picks up a different laser phase shift than the neighboring atoms. And as soon as you go from ground state to excited state, you can see the electronic spin is actually different. And when you come back through the tunneling, you, you, and you de-excited atom from ground state, to, uh, excited state to ground state, you complete this journey of one, uh, one pan, through this enabling pancake and back, and you actually pick up this extra phase shift. This is like a geometrical phase shift. And here you also have these 10 different nuclear spins that's been hidden there that dictates using through quantum uh, statistics, statistics dictates how the atoms interact. So this really opens up a very interesting scenario of in, uh, investigating, say, condor lattice, uh, spin orbital momentum, where you have synthetic gauge field, and you can have a nuclear spins being governed underneath a, a magnetic field you created by just doing spin orbital coupling. And I want to make a, another connection to here, to Paris, to, Ke to Professor Kessler, because um, again, I think Jean Delibar, we, we, we could say he's an academic grandson of uh, Professor Kessler. And he was the one who told us we should do this kind of a spin orbital coupling in alkaline earth atoms. After Ian Spielman, my new colleague, did that in alkali atoms, this was really what Jean has been telling the community to do. And uh, finally, we are, do, we are heeding some of his, his advice and doing this with the clocks. 
So in the final couple minutes, um, I want to tell you that the final story that connects with Professor Kessler. It's a three-dimensional Fermi band insulator clock. And it comes from a very simple motivation, which is if, if I want to scale up my clock, well, it's already doing very well. Some of the very best clocks that people have ever built. But I would say this is actually only scratching the surface. And in some sense, that's because in one dimensional system, we were only able to put in about 1,000 atoms. If you keep putting more in there, you can see all these interaction effects. We can play games of tipping angles and so on, but there's a certain level of precision that just feels like scaling the problem up will be difficult. But what if we, have, we use the other two dimensions? Why should we confine ourselves to one dimensional problem, two dimensional problem? Let's, let's build a, a three dimensional optical lattice like that. What if you can put a one million atoms in there? 100 by 100 by 100, shouldn't be that difficult. And if you can really truly get to 160 second coherence time, the clock, the precision that you can build is three times 10 minus 20 at a second. This is a four orders magnitude better than what we are today. Uh, you know, when I told you about 10 to minus 16 at one second, look at this number. And if you had clocks like this, you can put a couple of them in, in the sky, remember, uh, that we heard today, uh, uh, Dima was telling us that you can build a network of magnetometers. <laughs> if you build a network of clocks like this, you can hear all the gravitational waves coming along uh, because the, the frequency shift will, will be experienced at this level. So how do we do that? Uh, and I think uh, there is already uh, a good choice because people like Emmanuel Bloch and uh, uh, Tillman, Esslinger, uh, and so on, have been building these so-called fermionic band insulators. And it, by poly ex extrusion principle or energy gap, if you cool the atoms down to sufficiently low temperatures, you will have guaranteed one atom per site. And I call it one clock per site, just to be different. And here comes the, to the connection of angular momentum again. You remember I showed you this picture of differential and dot G factors. And Kessler said, he, I became particularly interested in the application of the principle of conservation of angular momentum during interaction between electromagnetic radiation atoms. And he meant uh, at the time, I think, uh, about optical pumping effects. But then he already said, continuity was able to calculate the, the impact of these interactions on energy shifts. And, and of course, then you, the next logical conclusion is that those angular momentums will have impact on the energy shifts. We picked the angular momentum J equal to zero for electronic degrees of freedom, but there's a nuclear degrees of freedom. And if we want to build the best clock, we have to deal with that. Um, and if we write down mathematical formulas, it's very simple. You have the clock, unshifted clock frequency. Now, because of the delta G, there's a Zeeman effect, which, which we can very well characterize. There's a second order Zeeman effect, by the way, we can also characterize that away. But I want to emphasize on Scalar, tensor, and vector shifts due to the effect that there's a light has a polarization and the atom now has an angular momentum. So there's a scalar part, differential scalar uh, polarizability. There's a tensor part. And I put them together here because F is 9 half, the total angular momentum. So this is just a number. Just You can think of this as if it's a scalar. right? You can absorb those two together. Then there's a vector shift which is proportional to the sub specific MF sublevels, and also another term of tensor shift, which is a quadratic with MF sublevels. These two terms depend on specific MF levels. And uh, if we run the clock with a plus minus nine halves, then this term, if you run both ways, plus minus nine halves, just like, this is just like a Z-man effect, MF, MF, and it can be averaged away. Plus, we pick a particular geometry where C is zero, so there's no really polarization ellipticity. It's this term, which is also not important, because in the end, if we had a one clock polarization, we can easily absorb this also into, if I pick MF equals to nine half, then that's just a number just like F, it's nine half, so not important. And, and so in the one dimensional optical lattice, this was an easy problem to solve. You pick the quantization axis B to be the same as lattice laser light polarization, to be the same as clock laser polarization. And then you can absorb the polarizability of 
vector of the tensor and the scalar shifts into one term, and you can actually adjust that to be zero. This was a paper that we did in, in 2014. We did not adjust that to be zero. This was a so-called magic wavelength for scalar polarizability. And you can see there's still dependence, and that's because of the tensor contribution. Later on, we were able to, to combine them together to be near zero and characterize that total effect to be one times 10 minus 18. But now here comes the trick in three-dimensional lattice. You don't have that anymore. So you can have a you can have a quantization axis to be parallel with the clock lasers and to be parallel with x-axis and y-axis lattice lasers. But there's another dimension. The lattice laser coming along z-dimension will necessarily have a polarization that's not parallel. Plus, we, anybody who's doing optical lattice experiment uh, would know that you want the frequency to be offsetted. Uh, I think you remember reading Bill Phillips' paper back in 1995 about optical lattices. You know, this one point was very well emphasized. If you don't stabilize the phase, the, the, the lattice is going to be fluctuating all over the place. So you want the frequency to be different. And, and it turns out this uh, Professor Kessler's teaching of angular momentum coupling has a very, very natural solution for 3D optical lattice problem, and the, the, which is the following. If you look at plus or minus nine half, this is the magnetic sublevels of the nuclear spins. And this is so-called a, a scalar magical wavelength frequency. And if you pick your clock state to be minus nine half or plus nine half, they have this quadratic, remember they has a, the, the tensor shift has mf squared, the t quadratic term. And by moving away from the zero point where the scalar shift is zero, you can combine the tensor shift and the vector, sh uh, a tensor shift and the scalar shift to be zero at a frequency which is offset from zero scalar shift. That we already understood in one dimensional lattice. In another dimension, turns out the quadratic shift is exactly reverse the sign. It's, instead of plus mf squared, it's minus mf squared. And, in, and that gives you the fact that if you pick the same minus 9 half and that plus 9 half state, now in order to have a combined vector, sorry, scalar and a tensor shift to be zero, you have to frequency offset in the other direction from zero of the scalar magical frequency. So, so all you need, the solution is really rather simple. All you need is to pick frequency that's operating, the magical wavelengths to be operating at this point where the combined, all the shifts combined in the, in the, in the horizontal beams are zero. And then pick a different optical frequency for the magical wavelength for the vertical lattice, which is actually 300 megahertz offsetted. And it's again, also the combined tensor and the, and the, and the scalar shift is zero. So this clock, this three-dimensional lattice will have no AC stock shift. And once we realized that, we said, well, th that was one um, sort of roadblock for building a three-dimensional optical lattice. As soon as we realized this was a, not, not a problem, we went on to build it. And this is actually an experimental measurement showing you exactly that picture. So we, in this particular realization, we have about 40,000 atoms. It's not a million yet, uh, but we will work towards that. Uh, and we can put them into optical three-dimensional lattice. This is what Tillman actually showed in the morning about band mapping. And you can see that atoms are confined in the first Brillouin zone, Brillouin. Uh, and, but uh, we, I, I love to do this experiment in the spectro clock spectroscopy. You can simply just measure the so-called side bands, red side band, blue side band. You can see absolutely no populations in the, in, in the upper uh, states because it's just cooled down to the absolute zero temp uh, ground states. If you have other nuclear spins, supposedly you want to do SUN physics, you can actually put a, a uh, if it's spin polarized, the atom would have to go to the upper band because of a Fermi uh, exclusion principle, poly exclusion principle. But if it's a different nuclear spin, they can reside in the same ground band. But interaction energy would be so much because it's a three dimensional space. Uh, the confinement is very strong. And you can actually see the, the interaction side bands. Uh, very much resolved from the atomic inter uh, from the so-called carrier transition of the clock. And this clock transition, th this is a scale of kilohertz. Here we use the huge optical field to saturate the transitions. When I really go do clock experiments, this line would be on the order of 80 millihertz or so, or narrower. And so these kilohertz scale energy shifts are completely suppressed in the clock. That's what I was quoting you the number of 10 to minus 24. The final slide that 
this three-dimensional optical lattice now can allow us to demonstrate that this is really the longest the direct atom light interactions uh, that showing the coherence over the time scale of six seconds and longer. And it's limited by our laser at the moment, and we certainly work, continue to work on our lasers. But right now, the Q factor is already bigger than what initially in the 90s, when Jen said, this is going to be bigger than 10 to the 15. We said, oh, wow, this is maybe many, many years down the road. It is many years down the road now, but we actually above that number. It's not 10 to the 17, but I think you can see there's this, I think there's no fundamental limit whatsoever. Uh, technical solutions are in front of us that we, we, we think we should be able to do that. I want to thank uh, people who work on, this, on these experiments and also you know, many generations of students have uh, in fact go, gone by. Um, and I want to make some, directly uh, make a connection to Paris. Tom Zanon, fortunately I was able to have him as a young postdoc, very energetic to figure out all these angular momentum problems. You can see the, the scientific lineage there. Uh, we have had a collaboration with uh, uh, Rob, uh, Robin Kaiser, um, Ennio Arimanto, and so on. So I think without Professor Kessler setting such a far side vision on, on science, on atomic physics, and so on, we wouldn't have moved this far on building atomic clocks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, talk, giving such an uh, overview of a field which is evolving so fast with amazing perspectives in the near, you promise, in the near future. Yeah, uh, because okay. I think Tillman and Esslinger and so on can build one million atom uh, mod insulator, band insulator tomorrow. <laughs> okay. But uh, Mark Kasevich, for example, is saying he can give us continuous atomic light, uh, atomic source. And if you have two vacuum chambers, one vacuum chamber collecting atoms from his atomic source, the other one you yeah. continue to evaporate. Okay. I think it is scalable problem that you can make, be able to make those very large atoms okay. ensembles. So ca can you comment a little bit about the use of these clocks for gravitational wave detection uh, and how it would compete with uh, the other yeah. avenue for that? At the moment, if you use the 10 to minus 20 number that I quoted yes. here, it, the sensitivity will be complementary to LISA. Uh, if you put a two, so you don't need a three arms, you just need two. Because fundamentally when the gravitational wave comes, it will jitter the two clocks a little bit and you can actually measure the Doppler shifts between the two clocks. Um, what, what's interesting about this atom-based approach is atom is essentially a very high Q resonator. And so it will only respond in some sense to a millihertz frequency. But actually that's not true because we know from quantum metrology field you can do so-called dynamic decoupling. So instead of just having two Ramsey pulses, you can add multiple pulses in the middle, allow you to shift the sensitivity of atomic resonance to different frequencies. And so what do we claim this is going to be a, a major advantage is you can achieve the same sensitivity at a millihertz with LISA, but as, as you go to higher frequency LISA sensitivity starts to decrease but our sensitivity can be maintained the same because you can do dynamic decoupling to different resonant frequencies. The disadvantage of this is this is not a broad band. So this is a going to be, you have to give me a guidance. You, can, you have to say, June, look, look into that corner. There is a gravitational wave coming. Uh, and if, you, if I know, for example, the two black holes are just about to get into each other, I can follow, this detector can follow as they move in, chirp their frequency into 10 hertz where the least LIGO can detect on ground. We should be able to follow all the way from millihertz to 10 hertz. But on its own, it's probably terrible in searching gravitational waves because it's not fundament fundamentally, it's not a broad band device. It's a narrow band, but you can tune, it's like a tunable, tunable fork, uh, like listening to the music of gravitational waves. <laughs> So I have so many questions, it's hard to decide which ones to ask. <laughs> Only one, oh gosh. <laughs> okay, so um, you pick fermions because fermions have this wonderful uh, uh, characteristic of not colliding. Yeah. And then of course you told us all this wonderful story. But now if you go to a 3D lattice, you can fix it so, so I, I, they I, really don't collide. Yeah. So could you use the bosons yeah. or will you have no transition amplitude? Yes, no, so I, I kind of sort of anticipated Bill was going to ask that question. <laughs> because, yeah, you would think if you make 
fermionic, initially fermions are really important uh, in, in a one pancake where they're interacting. So then the part, this Fermi statistics makes it, plays a big role. But if you're going to build a mod insulator anyway, the um, bosons can do the same thing. And uh, the only thing is strontium-88 uh, doesn't have that clock transition. Remember that clock transition comes from that nucleus spins and mixing up those electronic states. As you said, the clock state, you would require something else. I mean, it's still else. there, but the, but the transition moment must be The really, lifetime of the bosonic really isotope, triple P0, is, <laughs> according to theorists, uh, 5,000 years. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> however, uh, Tom Zanon, for example, he's sitting somewhere in the audience. When he was in our group, we actually came up with the idea of using two photons. You can actually drive with two photons. Yeah. Or you use a big magnetic field, which act as a mixing field. Yeah. It can also work. What's because it polarizes the something? <laughs> well, it's essentially, if you have a big magnetic field to a point where you can go to the passion bar regime, you, okay. can, you can, electron can, you know, you can couple electron to the yeah. earth magnet, to the lab magnetic field. You can introduce wave function mixing to the triple P0, just like a nuclear spin was doing. And the problem with that is the magnetic field required would be on the order of a few thousand Gauss or Tesla and so on. So if, unless you can sort of close your own loop using clock to define, using time to define the magnetic field and use the magnetic field back to define the time, then that could be okay. Otherwise, the magnetic field itself will cause a fundamental systematic yeah. uncertainty that would be a bit difficult. But perhaps Tom Zanon's idea of using two photon, then you, as long as you can, can control the two photon AC stock shift, yeah. Annual Arimanto has <laughs> been looking into that as well. And that, that would be another possibility. Yeah, so maybe there's some magic uh, <laughs> uh, choice of two photon wavelengths. That, that's right, yeah. <laughs> I, I think the 3D lattice does open up these kind of a discussion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Jean? Uh, just a question about the 3D lattice and the clock operating at the level of 10 to minus 20, 10 to minus 21. It seems that the gravitational shift, the red shift between the top atoms and the bottom atoms seems to be on the order of 10 to minus 21, if I have a 10 micrometer by 10 micrometer by 10. I mean, to, yeah, 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 correct. And so then you will have inhomogeneous broadening due to, to the gravitational <laughs> shift. So That's correct, is yeah. It, is that the, the, starting there, to there be a limit, or do you have to go to, then to pancake traps? <laughs> what, what are you thinking of? No, you are exactly right. There will, there will be, gra you know, one thing we were thinking about, it's not a quantum gravity, you know, I don't want to say that, <laughs> but it's, it's something that uh, will be a trivial test of all these red shifts that, and, and that you actually have to worry about the atoms even by, uh, separated by optical wavelength. What, what are the, and, uh, Optical wavelengths, okay, that's yes. too small. But, it, but a couple of layers later, yes. like you said, mm -hmm. there will be a substantial gravitational redshift, and mm -hmm. that will lead to dephasing. Yeah. But it won't fundamentally cause a systematic error if, if you control. And of course, when you compare that clock to another clock, there, there will be some uncertainties. Sure. How do you control the atomic layer mm -hmm. to such a level? And so my solution to that is, that's why I'm a big fan of Christoph somewhere. Uh, he always says clock should go to space. He has a, this vision from 1990s. And I totally agree with him because by then, uh, in fact, Dan Klapner wrote a very nice paper article in Physics Today back in 2000 or so. He said, this is like these people making atomic clocks. I think he wrote a paper comment our, on our science paper in 2008. He said this made him to think about the days when uh, Captain Harrison was building clock on the roughing ocean, uh, and you carry a little watch to the to the ocean, and the watch is no longer accurate. Our Earth is like a rough sea when the, when you have atomic clock like this, and indeed maybe in the future it should really be in space. But uh, what I wanted, sort of in the lab, and maybe the community wants, is push the quantum technology as far as we could, um, and to see what what's possibility. Christoph. Uh, uh, June, uh, we talked about it before, but I don't remember the answer. So, uh, you will have the dipole dipole interaction when you have one atom per site. Yes. And they are very regularly spaced, so yes. they can uh, contribute to coherent uh, you know, uh, shifts. And, uh, yes. Have you estimated uh, this dipole dipole interaction? Yeah. Yes, we estimated, and it's actually some, somewhat, it's, it's a problem that we will have to solve. Um, in fact, this was. Uh, 
and in fact, uh, Robin Kaiser came to Jella uh, two years ago, and we talked about this problem that when the atoms are filled in one by one, as you said, and you excited this, these atoms to a coherent superposition, there's a radiating dipole. This radiating dipole is incredibly weak. It's a one micro dipole, and it's very different from quantum gas experiment that I was doing with Debbie Jing. Uh, nevertheless, this will become a collective effect. This is actually, it's kind of funny to think of atoms like this is in our, what Professor Kessler would say, uh, a, a sort of a dance media. And this is it, it is, and the clock is so accurate, this will be considered as dance media. And how do we solve problems like this? I, don't, I do not want to say I have a solution at the moment. I think this will be a 10 to minus 19 effect. Uh, it will show up in the next decade when we push the clock down. It will be there, but I think there are solutions possibly, you know, you can imagine rotating these dipoles in a certain speed and it averaging away the dipole interactions or by building certain configurations of your 3D lattice, maybe not a cubic lattice, and have dipoles oriented in a certain way with polarizations to average away the dipole effect. But that, that's actually a fascinating field on its own. Okay, <clears throat> so thank you very much again for this fascinating talk.